Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Uh, sorry about this weird microphone today, but uh, today I sit down for a conversation with none other than Barkley Marathon's finisher, number 15, John Kelly. Let's get right to it. So as I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, I did go out to the 2021 Barkley Marathons. I took my GoPro, hiked up to the fire tower, and did some filming, uh, filmed a couple places uh, from public mark trails. I was there as a uh, spectator, as just a fan of the of the Barkley, uh, who happens to be a YouTuber. Uh, I did not reach out to Laz for permission to film, uh, and for that, you know, that was a mistake on my part, uh, since I do have a YouTube channel that gets out to you know the broader public. Um, you know, I should have done that. But then uh, the next day, I received a message from uh, the race director, Lazarus Lake, uh, Gary Cantrell, and he uh, told me to take the video down because uh, I was not authorized uh, to be there. So I took his video, I took the video down at his request, and then uh, the rest is history, <laughs> as they say, uh, you all know. So uh, anyway, uh, today I sat down with John Kelly for a very good, much needed conversation uh, about why these rules are in place uh, regarding media. Uh, John provides us with some great history and context of things that have happened with the race in the past, that has led the race director to create the, to create these rules. I think this is an important conversation to have because from the outside, uh, it could potentially just look like uh, a power thing, uh, which it's not. It's solely about preserving the race uh, and and the park. So, anyway, John provides us with some great context. So, without further ado, let's get right to the interview with John Kelly. All right. Well, first, John, let me say a huge thank you uh, for you agreeing to come on and talk about this. Uh, you know, it's an important issue. Uh, I just want to say, you know, personally. You know, you are a huge inspiration to me, uh, and I couldn't think of anybody better uh, in this community of ultra runners to represent the sport. So just thank you so much for coming on and, and doing this. Yeah, thanks so much for having me and being willing to have this conversation. It's, it's an important one to have. I've, I've kind of been hibernating all winter here in our lockdown in the UK, uh, as, as you can see with whatever's <laughs> going on here. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to have this discussion. All right. Well, let me, I'll, I've got a couple of questions. Um, you know, obviously I would love to hear your experiences of Barclay as a whole, but we're not going to, you know, get into that. People can, there's plenty of podcasts and videos of you out there uh, where everybody can research and, and find all that out. So um, I'll just get straight to it. And I guess, um, you know, if you could just first maybe give us some, some history uh, of the issues the race has had in the past uh, and kind of why that's created the need for, uh, for Laz to have these rules for the media in place. You know, what, what's led to those decisions from, from the race director? Yeah, it's, it's definitely been a, a balancing act as, as the race has, has grown in popularity. Um, the original issue arose uh, as, as far back as about 20 years ago. Wow. Uh, as the race started to, to grow a bit. So this was well before the documentary. Um, back in those days, people did go off trail to train. Um, it, you know, I, I myself, I grew up at the base of Chimney Hop and Chimney Top, and, and we'd go on family hikes up the south side there where there's no trails. And oh, there's wow. a, coincidentally, I have a picture of me when I'm about four or five sitting there with my dad at the exact spot where the last Barkley book is, is normally <laughs> placed on, on the course. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Um, so, you, you know, that, that was, uh, that was then, um, certainly now I, I, I would never go off trail and, and issues started to arise with the, uh, former, uh, head park ranger and, and park management that had concerns about the, the impact, uh, on the, uh, environment, uh, going and, and, kind of tramping some of these sens sensitive areas down, making trails into the park for poachers. Uh, and the race was actually uh, temporarily shut down uh, about 15 years ago by the park management. Uh, took a, a resolution from the Tennessee Senate uh, to oh, get wow. the race back up and going. Um, so th this, this was again, all due to the uh, concerns for the environmental impact um, and going off trail. And so that's kind of why the, the number of runners has remained limited. Uh, that's, that's why going off trail anytime other than the race, uh, isn't allowed. And, uh, one of the reasons that, that kind of 
keeping those parts of the course under wraps um, beyond uh, kind of the extra challenge it adds for, for participants, but uh, to, to prevent the temptation of people trying to go explore those areas and uh, you know, put, put the race back in a spot uh, where it's, it's at risk uh, for getting shut down again. Wow. Yeah. I know, uh, in talking with some of the Rangers at frozen head, I know there's one of the areas in particular, I think, uh, they've explained that there's some species of plants in that area that really is only native to Tennessee. Uh, and that's why it's been so, I guess that one part of the course has been, uh, not been used for a while, uh, because of that. Yeah. There, and there's, there's one spot that, that used to be a, a major part of the course and, and it was kind of off limits for around two, 15 years or so, 2019 was the first year that it was added back to the course. Wow. So it, yeah, there, there are definitely some areas uh, that they're more protective of uh, than others even. Yeah. So then as uh, the more recent years, you know, obviously we have the documentary and other things that have brought this race to the, the public eye. Uh, have there been more recent challenges, uh, you know, not just the off trail you know, potential issues for, you know, visitors to the park thinking they can do that, but uh, uh, any other issues that you are aware of that, you know, has led, uh, you know, the race director to create, you know, certain areas that media can go uh, and cannot go to film? Yeah, it's it's been, a, a again, a, a balancing act trying to, uh, I mean, the, the feeling is that it's it's worth it to, to get the message out there and, and get the experience of, of the runners out there uh, and to to get the the message of, of the value of, of doing hard things and, and going out and uh, experiencing the wilderness. Uh, and I, I actually, I, I put a blog post up about a year ago um, that was straight um, from the race director called uh, Media in, in the Wilderness. And so on one hand, uh, there's very much a, a desire to get that out there, but there's also, uh, again, concerns with too many people coming out and uh, causing harm to some of those areas, whether it's directly or through uh, kind of motivating people to, to go check out some of those off-trail spots themselves, uh, or uh, just uh, affecting the experience of the runners. You know, you know there's, there are people who, who work for years and, and wait for years for the experience uh, and, and the challenge of, of being out there with this very isolated and, and unsupported feel. Uh, and I know that it, it would be easy to look at, at the, the documentary um, and where dreams go to die and the other things that have come out and, and think, well, that, that's just not there anymore. Uh, and, and I was fortunate the first year I did it was, was right before the documentary came, came out. Uh, and since then, the feeling in, in camp has very much changed. The feeling that fire tower has very much changed. Uh, but but once you're out there, you, you're out there still. Uh -huh. yeah. it, you know, when when you get to the rest of the course, uh, whether it's the on trail section or, or the off trail section, that that has been maintained. Um, so yeah, it, keeping that there, um, also keeping it to where there's no influence on the outcome. Uh, it, you know, as, as unfortunate as uh, Gary Robbins finish in 2017 was, if someone had been there kind of where the course rejoins the trail, sure. uh, photographer or any sort of media, he, he would have realized his mistake and, and turned the correct direction for, for a happier finish, but not in a way that, that even Gary uh, would have wanted. So, yeah, yeah the, the runner experience is a big thing, protecting the park and, and then just flat out limitation of space you know the campground has 24 campsites and one bathhouse uh, and even if you just have essential staff a handful of media and one crew member per runner you're already at 100 people uh, with those yeah. 24 campsites and one bathhouse wow yeah now i guess as a race participant as you've done the barclay now is it four times is how many times you've yeah, yeah, I've done it four times and, and crewed it once. Okay, so as a, a race participant, and you know, you mentioned you know you being out there on the course, uh, you know, alone essentially for the whole time, or maybe with another another participant. How do you think the presence of media 
uh, whether it's at the fire tower or at the camp or wherever else they're allowed, has uh, altered that for you as a participant, you know, that feeling of being out there and alone, or has it affected that, do you think? So again, what once once out on the course, uh, it, it hasn't. Uh, it is a different feel on uh, in camp. Uh, it's a different feel at the fire tower, at least on loop one. Uh, generally, by the later loops, people don't come up and try to time it, and the weather's usually awful, and it might be the middle of the night. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's usually loop one at the fire tower that that has a lot of people. Uh, but other than that. You know, there, there were a couple of years where the course involved crossing Highway 116, mm -hmm. uh, as allowed some media to go near those crossings. Um, but otherwise, there's there's been nowhere else I've, I've seen anyone. I, I think you may have let some people set up some deer cameras one year <laughs> uh, in, in a few spots. Uh, and, you, you know, it, Ethan, when he was there doing Where Dreams Go to Die, I know that was one of his big frustrations was not being able to get on course footage. And he even took some crap from people because he was over at the um, the, the top of, this isn't on the course anymore, but the, the top of Meth Lab Hill and Testicle Spectacle, which oh, yeah. is, is an accessible area. Um, but he, he was there when, when, when Gary and I came through. So, yeah, once you're out there, you, you've your your focus on on on, on trying to, to get around and, and keep going and there's, there's not thoughts of the media or, or Twitter or anything you still very much uh, have that feeling of, of being alone yeah so as a local you know I live very close to the park you know not as close as you uh, lived growing up but you know pretty close to the park um, you know when people do that do follow Twitter and they see a post from Keith Dunn they know the race is on and uh, maybe they live local and they want to go to the fire tower, uh, potentially, um, you know, how, I guess, how could someone that maybe not be inside the Barkley circle know where, where, or where not they're allowed to go? Uh, is there a place or a way that they could find out, you know, these media rules, uh, without having to contact the RD, uh, since they're just going out to the park or what's the best way to handle that? Yeah, that's that's something that that to be honest, um, probably should be posted a, a bit more prevalently uh, somewhere. I, maybe I'll toss that up, up on my blog somewhere before next year's race. Um, but yeah, in, in general, I mean, in in years past at least, the fire tower has been fine, um, and you know, the other public areas at the park, it's it, it is a public park, and and you know, it's it's your park, it's it's everyone's park that lives around there, and you know, if you want to go out and enjoy the park, go out and enjoy the park by all means. Um, but it, you know, there, there's just try try to give the runners their their space still and not do anything that's that's going to affect the race or uh, and encourage people to to go some of the spots where they're they're heading off trail or or anything like that. So. Uh, yeah, pr pretty much the, the fire tower has been the spot and, and even, you know, at that spot, it's supposed to have been a, a viewing point. Uh, yeah. there's, there's no support allowed there. Uh, it's supposed to really not be cheering, but that's that's going to happen. I mean, let's let's be real. Um, so, yeah. And, and if, if, if you do want to see what else you can do, maybe maybe be a part of camp or whatever, um, email Laz and you know I'm, I'm sure he's uh, likes to, to give preference to, to local people but he also wants to give it if, if, if only a limited number of people can be there and he wants to get the message out and it's useful to have the people that have the biggest audience sure um, certainly and, you know so sadly that's that's just math yeah uh, so you know I, I wouldn't I, I know it's it's real easy to, to view it as as the Barkley Circle or the, the Barkley Click or or whatever, um, and you know, I I, I hate that. Um, there's to me it's it's the least the elitist race in the world. It doesn't care if you're the sacrificial virgin or the top ultra runner in the world. It's it's going to crush you. Yeah, uh, it's, <laughs> it's going to level the playing field and and do the same thing to everyone. Uh, there. Laz likes to give people an opportunity to do it, you know, a second time or so to, to get their best effort after they've learned. And, and there has to be a certain number of veterans in the field. 
in order for anyone to have a chance. Uh, yeah. we That was one of the issues this year. There wasn't a lot of veterans in the field, um, and it was a relatively new course. Uh, so that that navigation knowledge just wasn't there. So yeah. you know, there, there's the Barkley Fall Classic now, the Barkley Challenge Loop, all of these other things to, to hopefully give people a, a little bit of a taste of it. Uh, and, you know, but unfortunately, there's there's just the limits on, on what the park can handle before we start harming it and what the race can handle and, and what the campground can can handle. Certainly. And when I meant when I said the Barclay Circle, I didn't mean like a, a clickish. I just meant there's the people that are in Barclay. There is an inside uh, community where you guys talk to each other and discuss race things that, yeah. that, that, that we don't understand. And we don't know because we're not, you know, I've not done the race like as yeah, a fan, I, I, as a. Sorry, go ahead. Well, no, I, I was just saying, yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right there. And, and I can see very much how it would be easy to for it to, to feel that way. And I, I think that as much um, as parts of the race have, have kind of had this shroud of, of secrecy around it, there are some things that I, I think need to be a bit more publicized and uh, readily available as far as why some of these things are. I mean, again, I, I guarantee you, 99.9% and over of people who now follow Barkley have no idea that it, it took a resolution from the Tennessee Senate to get the race back up and running 15 years ago uh, because of concern of, of off-trail impact. And so, yeah, those those things need to be out there. Um, people need to have that knowledge, but still, I, I, it's it's easy to, to I, I think, view it as, as a, a circle the same way that, you know, there's I still haven't gotten into Western states. And so, you know, there's, there's a circle of people always talking about Western states. Yeah, and how absolutely. It is. And I, I don't know, maybe, maybe one day, but yeah, just unfortunately there, there are limits on, on capacity on, on these things. Yeah. And I certainly didn't know about the, uh, the uh, letter from the Senator that was required for, you know, trying to get Barkley back open. I, I think I first heard of that. Uh, in discussions with one of the park rangers at frozen head actually uh, actually this year is when i heard about that so yeah i don't think i, I agree i think the general public uh, could benefit from knowing that in some of these difficulties uh, you know because if not then they, they don't understand why and it, it makes it more difficult but speaking of western states um why do you think it's important for a race director to manage access to an event like the barclay and what do you think set uh, sets the barclay apart from races like Western States or maybe even UTMB, where now they're now they're live streaming UTMB. I mean, obviously we're not going to have that at Barkley, but uh, I mean, what do you think? I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I've I'm not an RD myself. I, I haven't had to deal with a lot of these issues, but I, I know that especially on on public lands, there are a lot of permit issues that that people have to go through, and those place uh, serious restraints on the number of people that are allowed to do the race mm -hmm. and if if that goes over or if there's you know an impact um that's uh, causes damage to the area then the the races are, are gonna get canceled uh so it's it's very much something of getting as many people in as possible uh, without going over, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit like the, the price is right. If you, if you go over, <laughs> you, you go bankrupt and, and it all comes crashing down. Uh, so it's, it, yeah, it's, it's difficult. And, and especially in, in this day with all, all the exposure of things and, and everyone has, um, you know, the social media and, and videos and, and everything else that, that's out there that's so quickly accessible. Uh, and it, I can imagine it's it's quite the headache to manage, and I know that Laz has dealt with a, a lot of people that have uh, willfully and, and intentionally be, been trying to circumvent some of these things, and, and that would cause harm to the race. Um, you know, they're they're not even doing it out of out of ignorance; they're they're just doing it because um, wow. it, it, intentionally, um, and so. I, I can imagine that that gets quite frustrating, and I can imagine that his uh, his initial response to you was was probably unpleasant and uh, <laughs> a, a bit 
a bit probably uncalled for uh, how unpleasant it was. Uh, and, it, you know, he, he's not perfect. Uh, he, he doesn't um, always say the right things, or always make the right decisions, but, you, you know, none of us are. And I, yeah. I can imagine a, a feeling of being out of patience um, if the assumption is that someone is is doing something um, willfully or, or for the wrong reasons, uh, and that's probably an assumption he he jumped to, especially after a, a weekend with no sleep. Uh, just like it's easy for it, you know, it, it's easy yeah, for absolutely. anyone on your side to see a snippet on the internet and jump whatever assumptions and, and conclusions they want to. Absolutely, yeah. And I reached out. I did reach out to Laz and kind of messaged him privately just to you know apologize because I you know obviously had no intention of. Uh, causing any of the, the ruckus that uh, that it did and he responded and you know was uh, you know of course mentioned like you did you know he'd been up for I don't remember how long for quite a while in the pouring rain and uh, you know didn't respond the best way and I appreciated that as well so uh, yeah certainly understandable yeah, I've, I've gotten a few cranky emails from Les myself <laughs> probably not to the level we got, um, but I, I've gotten them <laughs> well uh I know you said you're not a race director and have not been, but I mean, you're familiar with, uh, with racing events and in particular Barkley and Laz, do you think, or, well, how does an RD control or, uh, control might not be the best word, but, uh, request access areas for in a public event like this and at a public state park when it's not closed, uh, the state park being, do you think, this should be handled any differently in the future, potentially? Like, has that ever been looked at that you're aware of, like maybe closing the state park, like renting it out or something? Or... Yeah, I, I don't know what the, the costs involved in that would be. I, I do know that they've, in the past few years, uh, the race has started renting out the entire campground to mm -hmm. where they could essentially close down the, the campground to public access. Yeah. Uh, as, as far as closing down the whole park, I, that's probably pretty pretty cost prohibitive, it, I imagine. Yeah, I, I don't know if the park would be uh, yeah open to that idea. I, I don't know what the cost of it would be, and, and to be honest, I just I I don't think it's it's necessary. I, I think there as as we've mentioned, there just needs to be more uh, visibility of, of kind of why some of these things are are in place. Um, rather than just a because I said so type deal. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, people, it's, it's it's a nice time of year. People should be able to go out and, and enjoy the park <laughs> if, if they want to. <laughs> Do you think there's anything that could potentially be done aside from, you know, Keith Dunn's twi Twitter feed where he always, you know, provides updates of, you know, so-and-so reached the fire at this time or, or whatever. Uh, maybe something along those lines that could potentially bring – more in the moment coverage of the Barclay, but still in those restricted areas, you know, the, the campground or, or the fire tower. Do you think there's any way we could, that something like that could possibly be done with still maintaining that Barclay mystique? Yeah, I, I don't know. This, this, I mean, that, that would be tough. I, there, there are of course tracker technologies out there now but well certainly can't use that though with that is, is it would show exactly yeah. where off trail <laughs> uh you know you could maybe have it to where it registers checkpoints and and shows people yeah. along the course um you know so so checked in at the prison spot yeah get you know get to certain spots um that that people know where they are and, and that are uh publicly accessible uh it, so i I don't know. I, I also don't know if, uh, you know, that that is something uh, that, that Laz wants. Uh, yeah, no, I know. Kind of likes the uh, once every six hours or 12 hours uh, yeah. updates that, that come through. The yeah. other issue, of course, is, is cell service at that park's pretty much. Uh, Keith has some sort of black magic. I, I don't know he how has he's to. working the way that he does in the campground. He's doing that it's, from the campground. Yeah, yeah. As, as wow. soon as you go to the campground, like I've I've gone out there so many times, and I'll I'll be <laughs> going into the park, and I'll get to like the the visitor center. I'm like, okay, I still got two bars, and I'll walk up, and it, like as soon as I cross that gate into the campground, campground just nothing, it, it's gone. But 
he stands there right at the yellow gate and uh, wow. gets it. I think he has an older iPhone that he keeps specifically because it gets better service there wow. than, than some of the newer models. <laughs> We're going to have people out there trying to fix an iPhone with a crazy antenna. That's I've never, well, yeah, yeah I have no signal out there for probably 90% of that park. It's crazy. Um, I guess this is somewhat similar, but I mean, we know that there's a desire from the public to to know more about the Barclay. We know that's a fact. You know, people love these documentaries and uh, YouTube videos have been out by, you know, Ethan and, and Jamil. Uh, you know, they're very popular, but obviously there's the the Barclay mystique that is what makes Barclay Barclay. Uh, how do you think, is there a way we can kind of walk that fine line of providing coverage to the Barclay or, or are the Keith Dunn tweets that, uh, but also keep that mystique, you know, as you, I don't know, I just, I, I just trying to think if there's any way that we could bring more of this to the public potentially, but, uh, you know, still keeping that Barkley aura. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that, you know, again, some, a summary of, of information, uh, somewhere would, would be quite useful, a, a written set of information. Yeah. So don't have to, you know, pour through because it, it, you know, things are pretty scattered and the info's out there, but you, you can't expect someone to do a week long research project to, to figure all of that out. Yeah. Uh, when their goal is to kind of understand what the race is about and, and understand uh, some of uh, what's going on on the weekend rather than people searching for, for how to get in to the race, which is, is a whole different story. Yeah. I mean, cause that's, you know, from a personal perspective, uh, you know, one of the areas I filmed um, is apparently a no-go zone for for uh, of Laz's media uh, rules, uh, which is understandable. It is it was still on a publicly marked trail, um, and it's a place that's you know other races the Barkley Paul Classic has run. Um, but I had no clue about that because, uh, like you said, you know, I've done plenty of research on how to get into the Barkley and all of that stuff, and I've never seen a a list of you know, media roles. So that would certainly, I think, be very beneficial if that was something that was public and, uh, yeah. you know, people could could find with a moderate search. You know, I think that would be beneficial. Yeah. And, and, and Laz does have this. Um, he just, he, you know, there's there's no official Barkley web page or anywhere yeah. to post those things. And so he shares those with the media that are actually there. And and that's, that's again, one reason uh, for the media getting permission is, is not so much for the sake of getting permission but to indicate that oh yes i've i've seen the rules and i know what they are yeah um and, and having recognition of that but yeah I, I mean I, I agree there's there is information that should be out there more easily accessible um and i'm sure that uh laz would be open to considerations of of how to uh let people uh experience more of the race without uh again without uh, putting the park or the race's use of the park uh, in danger and yeah, without affecting the, the runner's experience and, in a negative way. Yeah, certainly. Well, um, that's all the questions about the media that I have. I have a couple other ones, but is there anything else that you think would be important to get out there to, you know, other small YouTube channels or uh, just the public in general that, uh, you know, might be helpful uh, pertaining to you know media and or any any of that yeah i, I mean i again I, I recognize it's 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 tough being a, a a smaller channel um and i very much relate to the feel of being the uh the, the local guy that has a connection there but but no one uh gives the the time of day to i was there uh myself um before a certain finish one year uh and and so you know i'd love to see how we can get more people like yourself in, involved without uh, again without causing any uh damage to the, the park or the race or the runners um so you know any yeah. ideas for that um I'm, I'm sure uh people would would love to discuss and it Again, to me, it, it's it's about if you if you have limited numbers, how do you reach the largest audience? Yeah, uh, sure. Rather than 
I, I have no idea what sort of financial arrangements go on with with HBO and the likes when they go there. I, I don't know if there's if if they pay for that and if so, how much. Um, yeah, I've got no but, clue. You know, I, I do want to to kind of try to. I feel like there's a perception that it's it's just become about money, uh, and that's that's very much not not the case. Um, I mean, if if Laz wanted to make a ton of money off Barkley, he could uh, probably increase the entry fee by <laughs> about ten thousand percent from yeah. the dollar sixty that it currently is. Yeah. Um, he could hang sponsor banners from the yellow gate. He could, if it were permissible, to up the the uh, field size. He he could. Um, and you know, I, I know that he's no doubt made a lot of money by the increased popularity of his other races that have come about because of Barkley. There's sure, you know, yeah. who knows how much he made from, uh, the, the virtual race across Tennessee last year. And, you know, that's, these are his creations. He's worked very hard for, for Absolutely. decades uh, to put them together. And so, I mean, he, he deserves to make money off of that, but he has, uh, to my knowledge, very much uh, maintained uh, Barkley as, as being a feat of athletics and, and not a feat of finance. Uh, that, you know, there's there's a small Barkley fund uh, that helps uh, cover some of the race's costs through donations uh, each year. But uh, to, to my knowledge, there's, there's not direct money uh, being made off, or, or at least not a huge amount of it being made off of Barkley. And that's one of the neat things about the race, how it does still have the dollar sixty entry fee after thirty plus years of running. It's not like other races yeah. where it's seven hundred dollars to get into or something ridiculous, you know. I, I think this year it was a dollar sixty and a, a case of moxie soda. <laughs> oh, <that's, laughs> well, um, just looking forward to. 2021 uh for you personally for john kelly what do you have any events on your calendar or i know you guys over there are still pretty heavily locked down isn't is that right yeah we uh pretty much since christmas we've we've been kind of stay at home uh don't go anywhere I, I could go outside to exercise but i've done all had to do all my runs just from my front door haven't been able oh, wow. to go to the mountains or anything um we actually our, our six-month-old daughter is still a stateless person she uh <laughs> has no citizenship because oh, wow. the u.s embassy has been closed due to covid and so the, <laughs> the u.s government doesn't even know she exists wow so we're we're hopefully coming back out of it um, slowly. Vaccine rollouts going going pretty well over here. Uh, I've used those three months in lockdown to uh, for the first time in my life. Uh, it took three months with zero in-person social interactions to grow a beard that I'm not <laughs> massively embarrassed of now taking out and having in-person person social interactions. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. But I. There are a few challenges here in the UK that I'm still hoping to do. Uh, last year, uh, I I set a record on the Pennine Way, the, yeah. the big national trail here. Uh, it had stood uh, for about 30 years, and uh, I, I broke it. And then my good good pal Damien Hall came along and broke it again a week yeah. later. I followed uh, that. It's, yeah, so I'm I'm uh, as soon as it's allowed, I'm, I'm hoping to get back out and have another crack at that. Uh, and then there's another big thing here called the Wainwrights, which hits oh, yeah. uh, 214 peaks in the Lake District. Uh, current record is over six days. Uh, hoping I can get take a good run at that. What's and the then, elevation uh, gain on that? I'm curious. Roughly. Ooh. Yeah, I'd have to. Uh, Are we talking more than 100,000 likely? With uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember the, the exact number. I feel like it's about 114, um, oh but don't, don't quote me on that. Wow. Uh, yeah, so it should be fun. What's uh, the distance on the 214? Do you know roughly what the total distance would be? Yeah, I, I this is one of those things where I, I knew in, until you asked me. Uh, <laughs> well, if it's six days, I imagine it must be uh, several hundred miles. 
Yeah, I, I feel like it's uh, about 500K, so about oh, wow. 310 miles. Wow. Uh, yeah, here it is, three, 318 miles. So just longer than Vol State, wow. Yep. So it's, uh, you, you know, the, the big the big factor over here is, is always the weather, the, the rain and the wind um, that, that have been quite tough. And yeah, it's, oh, never mind. Oh, yeah, there it is, 36,000 meters of ascent. Oh, um, okay. So that, that would put it roughly at the 114 yeah. um, that I mentioned. Wow. Um, and then September, looking to, to head back to Tortoise Yacht. Uh, oh, take nice. another track at that. I wasn't, wasn't fully content with my, my first effort. Uh, so be back there. I got them to actually list my country as U.S. this time. <laughs> I remember so, that. Okay. Uh, be, be representing there. And, and then, you know, we'll, we'll see where things are. Hopefully I can actually make it back uh, to Tennessee uh, next spring for, uh, you know, whatever next year's Barkley looks like. Okay. Some uh, other trips potentially, obviously, uh, pertaining on uh, or pertaining to the uh, COVID lockdown that gets lifted, you can travel, but try to come over and uh, reclaim your your frozen head kingdom again. Yeah, some some people have uh, taken some of my. I, for those that, that don't know, I when I was in Tennessee for about a month, uh, a year or two ago, I decided to to go out and, and grab all the Strava uh, segments in Frozen Head. <laughs> So while I've been over here in the UK, a few of those have gotten taken away, and uh, one day, well, one day I'll I'll be back at them, yeah. back at them. But we'll uh, we'll probably be over here for for a bit over a, a year um, before heading back, hopefully to uh, some somewhere near that area of, of the country. Yeah. Um, but it's just it's it's hard to make any plans that far out with uh, the way things have gone recently. Yeah. What, one of the uh, speaking of records, how you mentioned the record on the P9 Way. Uh, one of the things I found in some some research was apparently you set and and hold a Guinness World Record for the fastest marathon time in a character costume. Is that is that right? I, I, yeah, I I actually this is is that it right there? Yeah, this this was not planned to have this in the background of my camera. <laughs> it's actually sitting there because our landlords won't let us put nails in the wall to hang uh, things up. Uh, okay. But yeah, I I actually ran the Boston Marathon uh, in 2016. It was just two weeks after Barclay. Oh wow! And so uh, I knew, you know, there's no way I'm gonna set a personal record or, or anything running. A marathon two weeks after Barkley. So what can I do that would still be fun and still be a bit of a challenge? So I yeah. uh, dressed up like Link from the Zelda video games okay. and uh, w went out and, and snagged that. And and still a very impressive 257 in a car in a costume. That's that's still pretty good, especially two weeks after Barkley. Well, no, it was a so I mean Boston is is point to point, mm -hmm. and so there are years where it's really fast or years where it's really slow depending on the wind and and it was a head headwind year and wearing that link tunic I mean, it was like having a, a parachute on uh, <laughs> it's resistance it was, uh, training yeah yeah it was it was good fun and, and i will say uh actually getting that certificate was loads harder than than getting any sort of real record really i had to like yeah, I had to get witness statements from like a dozen people. I had to take selfies every single mile along oh the goodness. course. Combine that with my tracking information. Like it was Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't it was, realize it was uh, so intensive. They they verify those things. I guess they want they want them to be legit, so <laughs> well what uh what do you think has been the biggest surprise or something you just totally did not expect at all? Uh, as it pertains to running in the UK versus here in the States or, or Tennessee or wherever in the United States? I mean, they, they've got this whole network of, of footpaths here. And it's just this, all these public rights away that, that go across the entire country. Uh, and so we live a bit south of the, the city uh, in a sort of rural pastoral area. There's like a 5,000-year-old stone circle sitting oh, wow. outside 
you know, here. Um, but the, all these pastures and fields here, there are these footpaths that just go through them. And wh when I first moved here, I, I just, well, A, some of them are, are entirely indiscernible. It's like, you know, someone walked across this field with a sheep 500 years ago. <laughs> now it's um, so you, you've got to have some way of, of mapping them or, uh, you know, know where you're going. But it was it, it was really hard to get used to because here I am growing up in East Tennessee and I'm cutting across people's fields, climbing yeah. their fences, like running up their driveway right next to their um, the, their horse stalls and everything else. And every time I'm just thinking, well, not not if, but is it is it going to be a 12 gauge or a 20? -gauge? Exactly. That's what <laughs> I was going to say. You do that here, you'll get shot. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's neat. Um, it's it's really cool to, to have that. Um, it does, though, it gets uh, we're just now coming out of the muddy time of year where the, the whole winter that uh, you pretty much can't run on those pads because it's mud here is like you know in the, in the u.s it's it's dirt with a little bit of water mixed in and here it's water with a little bit of dirt mixed in yeah or you step in it and you just sink like halfway up to your knees i know you, in your race report i think it was for the uh the p9 way uh route you did i think there was one part where you mentioned you were running and stepped in a bog and literally sank up to like your waist yeah bogs are are something else it's uh you know you grew up seeing movies with, with quicksand in it yeah and then one day you realize oh hollywood just made that up quicksand is not a real thing <laughs> this is the closest thing to it except wow. it's not sand it's this nasty disgusting reddish brown water with a layer of peat line on top oh, wow and, and you can you can you can step in it and i, I mean whole tractors have sunk into this stuff and I, oh, i've my dropped in it before where you know you sink in and you just you literally can't move your legs wow. and you have to hope that you can reach forward and grab solid ground or kind of lay back and try to float until you can <laughs> get what you stepped off of it's uh it's it's nasty stuff that, that again until i actually fell in one i had had no idea what i was dealing with there is that something that you can like become accustomed to seeing and, and as you're running and know, Oh, like you can spot there's a bog now, or is that something that you just still can't? You get much better at it. There are some telltale signs. The grass that grows on top has a slightly different hue. It's a bit mm. brighter, a bit more of a neon color. Interesting. Um, and, and so, yeah, you learn to spot them a bit better, but even the best of them still get a, get an occasional surprise and, and find themselves. <laughs> going for a swim in one. Wow. Yeah, that sounds uh sounds like quite a challenge for sure. <laughs> Especially when you're trying to set an FKT. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man. Well, John, I just want to uh, thank you again for coming on. I really do appreciate uh you know the openness around uh around all of this and just chatting with me. I really do appreciate it. So just thank you. Look forward to having you back in the States at some point and maybe we'll cross paths uh or as I said, I think in one of our messages, as you more likely fly by me at Frozen Head State Park, uh, you know, maybe go for a run. So thanks for coming on. Yeah. I appreciate you, John. Yeah, th thanks so much for uh, being willing to have this discussion and, and get this information out there where it needs to be. Like I said, I think there's still more uh, we need to do in that area and, and more that can be done. And as far as letting people experience more of the race in a, a non-harmful way. So I think you know, so some creativity and some eyes, ideas there are, are needed. Um, and, you know, again, I appreciate the discussion and, and hope you hope to see you out at Frozen Head sometime. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, John. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, again, I just want to do a huge thank you to John Kelly, uh, just being willing to have that open, frank discussion, uh, answer some questions. Uh, and then down below, if you take a look in the description, there is a link to John Kelly's blog. He referenced the media in the wilderness. Uh, it's in the description below. Take a look at it. Uh, it gives you a little bit more context as well and uh, just some good info to, to read. So if you're, if you're wanting to do some filming uh, at the Barclay or other events. Anyway, uh, I just want to really encourage uh, anyone out there that, and remember that Frozen Head State Park uh, is a public park. Uh, it is a public state park where you have to stay on the park trails. There is no off trail, uh, there is no going off trail permitted uh, at Frozen Head State Park anywhere. You have to stay on the public, publicly marked trails. So if you saw something in a video at one point uh, from somebody else, you know, not not mine because I stay on the trails, 
but from somebody else, don't go try to do that. You stay on the park. Stay on the park trails. Don't create havoc for the, the park rangers uh, or for them have to call <laughs> us out because I'm on the trail runner rescue squad at Frozen Head State Park. So do the right thing. Stay on the park trails. Uh, and just, you know, if you want to go out and film uh, at the Barkley just for fun, uh, maybe you've got a YouTube channel, reach out to the race director first, uh, you know, communicate with them. Uh, that way you can uh, learn these rules of where you need and where you can and cannot go, uh, those types of things. So anyway, I hope this was helpful. hope this provided some much needed context and history and starts a broader conversation around the topic of media and uh, where us as small YouTubers fit in or where I as a small YouTuber and other YouTubers out there fit into that conversation. Because, you know, obviously I only I have a small channel. I don't have near the reach of somebody with hundreds of thousands of subscribers. That's how those other YouTubers started was as small as small channels. So uh, it, hopefully it starts a much needed conversation uh, surrounding the sport as a whole because there are other races as well and other types of events where they are trying to limit uh, media exposure. So anyway, thanks again to John Kelly. Uh, I really do appreciate his time. And anyway, if you guys want to take a look at another video, there's going to be one up on your screen you can take a look at. Or over on this side of the screen will be a playlist of some Frozen Head State Park trail running videos I've done. So anyway, go take a look at one of those, and I'll see you on the next one.